Hello, dear everybody all at once. This is Thea Cedar Jones, and this is going to be one of those rants about Chester Bennington and Chris Cornell, and maybe with some side glance to Kurt Cobain, because my recent estimation of his cause of death just <laughs> flip-flopped from buying the suicide story, which I've bought now for, oh my god, 23 years. Sorry, Kurt. I'm a victim of my stupid fucking mind control. Um, and now I'm a firm believer that Courtney Love definitely is a conspirator in the death of Kurt Cobain. And um, having that flip-flop happen in my consciousness about Kurt puts him in, in the category of guys who I love who've been murdered. And now I'm like, um, and I also, you know, I was sort of like dismissive of Chester Bennington because I never really thought his contribution was as good in the epoch of grunge because his voice was so whiny and thin and, and his message was such male complaint music and wasn't as good looking and his voice is thin and scratchy and screechy and his band is just... I mean, I always admired their music. I think musically they're as good as the other grunge masters, but it had a cold sheen of corporate veneer that I could never relate to. Add to that the sense of relentless inescapability of egoic wisdomlessness. And I'm like, ugh, that's the end of the grunge bargain that I just couldn't take. But I had a total conversion after Chester Bennington's death because of Aaron Lewis singing a tribute of the song Crawling. And I heard, you know, Aaron Lewis do Crawling. <laughs> and totally burst into tears and recognized all three parts of that song are perfect and beautiful and great and I can rel the message is relatable to me um, there's a way now that I can relate to what he's saying when he says fear is how I fall that's ego self-contraction to me that's, that's what I was always doing as well I can totally relate to that so now I'm going to cover that song, I'm going to sing that song, and that's going to forever be, you know, that song is just, is being covered by all these famous musicians who are still alive, and now that song has taken on a meaning that is associated with the death of, of Chris Cornell and Chester Bennington, and what does that mean right now in history? And I have to frame this in the context of hip-hop, because hip-hop had brave commentators willing to talk about pedophilia and Satanism and the Illuminati square, squarely, you know, straight up. Um, as far as I can tell on YouTube and before anybody was doing that in the rock world, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to the rock side in a minute, but I just want to frame this in the context that it was, for me, unbelievably you know I can't even describe the combination of disillusioning and consciousness raising to hear Black Dot specifically and Professor Griff deconstruct all these examples of Satanism mostly in the world of pop and hip hop and they would touch on rock a little bit and I was like, oh my god, how deep does the rot go? How horrible does this corruption go? And now I'm looking at every single celebrity or rock star, and I'm always asking myself in the back of my mind now, what do they know about Pizzagate? What do they know about Satanism? What do they know about child sacrifice and pedophilia in the elite um, ranks of the entertainment industry and the banking industry and the military industrial complex? That's my interrogatory missive towards every single celebrity I could think of. You know, Trent Reznor, dude. 
our youth in New Orleans and aligned with Marilyn Manson in a satanic way or did you not have kids what are you really involved with Trent Reznor how down the downward spiral do you go and now I need a rating system of like one to a hundred of, of like how corrupt how sold out to the Illuminati how in the know about child sacrifice are every one of my musical heroes all of them none exempt I'm talking what does Bjork know I'm talking what does Chris Martin know I had the disturbing and unfortunate encounter with Chris Martin doing his supposed tribute to Chester Bennington and try to sing Crawling while goofing off and laughing. His tone was off. His wife, Gwyneth Paltrow, this whole thing, how can you get to their level? They surely got $20 million or more. How do you get to that top level? Especially in Europe, Chris Martin is just disgustingly successful. His middle-of-the-road schlockola would never harm the status quo, would never scare the horses in the least tiny bit. You talk about Bono being a sellout. Chris Martin is some kind of like reduced fat version of Bono light. It's disgusting. And they're such beautiful voices and they're such exemplary musicians. And so now I, I as a rock and roller have to answer for these turds. Why would you sell out like that? Chris Martin, what do you know about satanic pedophilia? You really upset me. You smug bastard. Fuckers. <clears throat> and yes, this is all winding back to the, the heart and the source, which is Chris Cornell, Chester Bennington, and, and Kurt Cobain. And I'm not saying that Lane Staley was killed in the conspiracy, but Lane Staley's dead. And he was my favorite. Lane Staley was my leading example as a singer that got me to where I am today as a singer. Because he had relaxed projection, in my opinion. His upper resonance at times, and when I saw him at Lollapalooza especially, his projection was stronger than any human being who ever sang. I mean, I experienced that physically. And I saw Chris Cornell sing too multiple times and God bless him he is also the greatest singer in the world as is Mike Patton greatest singer in the world we're blessed with multiple great singers in the world that are just the heart throb in my heartbeat of love and my love for Chris Cornell and my and now my even love for Chester Bennington it it's just going out of bounds because if these guys really did if they really are I'm not saying they're perfect because I would have to ask them what did they know why did they wait this long to come out with the truth? Why did they fail? Or have they failed? Maybe this is their way of making the ultimate sacrifice for the truth. And that would be a fucking amazing thing for rock and roll. And just what we need to like get out of this Illuminati funk, this horrible decadence of the degradation in the values and quality of rock and roll music that we've seen in the last 17 years or more, But what percentage do I believe that uh, both Chester and Chris are not suicides? 100%. Um, I saw this one guy, a German EMT on YouTube, and he was saying, this, I mean, this guy, for one thing, I've never seen anyone hem and haw like they were watching every word they said for fear of their life. And I think this guy knows that he's in the know enough about the pharmaceuticals of Chris Cornell's death that once the toxicology report came out about Chris Cornell, it had four drugs. Caffeine, pseudoephedrine, a non-lethal dose of Ativan, and uh, a problematic dose of barbiturate, a very strong barbiturate. I don't remember the name of that fourth one, but the barbiturate part is like a kind of barbiturate that you can't even get legally prescribed in Europe. 
So it's something that you have to go out of your way to get. And why would Chris, who's a successfully recovering alcoholic and drug addict, personally be taking a heavy barbiturate, let alone the Ativan, which would be a kind of relapse indicator to take Ativan if you're a recovering alcoholic. And Chris would certainly know better than to do that. He supposedly was given Ativan by his bodyguard on the night of his death. Now that's suspicious enough to me to warrant a reopening of the investigation into Chris Cornell's death. And certainly the bodyguard really needs to be brought before the full legal questioning process. Um, that has to happen. I'm just telling you that has to happen on behalf of Chris Cornell just as a, as a bro and as a fellow musician. I'm not letting this go until this justice issue is resolved. You cannot do this to our musicians. I'm over it. I've had it. No more glamorous sacrifice of, of the rock stars. Not to Prince. No. Not to Kurt. No. You may not. Not to Chris. No. Not to Chester. No. Now, I'm ready to, to defend the life of, of rockers. I'm not a killer and I'm non-violently you know, committed, but this has to stop. The toxicology report showed that the combination of Ativan and barbiturate in Chris's bloodstream would have made him severely groggy and not able to do the very bizarre hanging job he did where his feet were not suspended in the air. It's very hard to break your neck enough to die a non less painful death through hanging. You've got to get your feet off the ground and neither Chester nor Chris had their feet off the ground. That enough should warrant a reopening of the investigation in both cases. But there are multiple good reasons to reopen the in cases in both cases. I'm not going to try to exhaustively cover that in this video. I'm going to hit a few highlights and you'll know my opinions already. My, my, my conclusion is already that this is not suicide in either case. And that foul play is certainly involved. But people, please ask yourselves why Chris Cornell, who has a family, who has children, and who has two amazing bands, and who's very, very, very well respected as almost the best that rock and roll can do. You know, a lot of rock and roll fans and a lot of rock and roll musicians think that Chris Cornell is the best singer who ever lived. He just the, the best singer ever. And I could devote a whole video to about how and why I agree with that, except that Lane Staley is the best singer ever, you know, for me. And I tried to emulate Chris. I gave it everything I have. And more than ever, I can now sing like Chris. But that wasn't my route to my own organic self-actualization as a singer, which is relaxed projection. And that's a lot more like Robin Zander and Lane Staley. It is so completely suspicious to me and should be to any investigator or any conscientious fan or friend of Chris Cornell that he had not one but two violations of his sobriety in his bloodstream to the extent that would have impaired him. There was no suicide note for either guy. <laughs> and the suicide note for Kurt Cobain looks to me like a composite letter of his original writing about a completely different topic than suicide, about him renouncing the music industry and ultimately his marriage to Courtney. In other words, getting out of the grind and getting away from his handlers. That is apparently his, was his intention towards the last month of his life. Let's say he gets to rehab 
He already has the shotgun before rehab, not after like Courtney claims. He has the shotgun before rehab. Why would you buy a shotgun before rehab? That's because you already intended to get clean enough to get the hell out of Dodge. Get out of Seattle. Go to Minneapolis with Kristen Pfaff. Get a divorce from Courtney. Give her 50% and cut her and the management team off. And save your life. And do what you want artistically. And be with Francis and Kristen. That to me was Kurt's game plan. And Courtney's claims that he took 66 or 67 um, uh, date rape drugs, whatever those, uh, which he wasn't even into. He was into heroin. He didn't OD on heroin in Rome. It was uh, the date rape drug. And Courtney says he overdosed on that because he was so bummed at missing Courtney that he committed suicide. He tried to commit suicide in Rome with Rohypnol. 66 Rohypnols. Or 67 Rohypnols. Kurt was so busted up over Courtney and missing her when in fact he's really trying to divorce her, right? She's claiming, oh, he's, God, he was so, he's so upset, man, that, you know, he, he missed me and he just tried to kill himself. Rohypnols. Courtney, fuck you, you stupid cunt. You think I'm going to fall for the stupidest, most deliriously fucked argument? Ugh. And the singer El Duce is saying that you, you, Courtney Love, hit him up, offered him $50,000 or some amount of money to quote-unquote blow his fucking head off. Referencing your ex-husband, Kurt Cobain. The Kurt Cobain case and the Seattle police collusion with the cover of his, of his death reeks and stinks of foul, foul play. And Courtney, you're not going get, to keep getting away with this. And whoever else was on the management team in collusion with Kurt's death, You're going to have the wrath of a billion heartbroken grungesters. Because grunge is as big of a religion as Islam. And you fuckers. You fuckers. I don't even want to spend any more energy right now on describing the medieval, nonviolent kinds of retribution I have in mind for you that only I could concoct. But back to Chris Cornell, who gave him the Ativan and the Barbiturate. Those people are complicit in his death. There's no way he could have hung himself with his feet not off the ground when he was blitzed on Barbiturates, downers, and Ativan. He had enough of that in his blood to be seriously impaired, even though he may have had a high tolerance, though he may not have. If he was really sober and this was a hit, and somehow they got um, Ativan into his beverage, into his smoothie, and they got the barbiturates and the Ativan into some of his drinks, and he was sober at the time, he would have had no tolerance, or very low tolerance, and it would have been very impaired and groggy and weird. So I don't know if I want to go too many and then much more details of Chris Cornell's case. Are you satisfied now that... Um, okay. One more thing. The Chris and Vicki Cornell Foundation, as other researchers have found, is not in good standing with the California Franchise Tax Board, apparently. 
and this just looks so suspicious that another charitable foundation focusing on children by Hollywood or entertainment industry <clears throat> elites like Chris and Vicki Cornell is not in good standing with the California Franchise Tax Board. What's up with that? So again, there's this suspicious foundation <laughs> And it's through this foundation that apparently Chris Cornell came into contact with a black book featuring names of known people of Hollywood affiliated with, with pedophilia. And I, it apparently Chester and Chris were going to do some kind of big reveal of what they knew about pedophilia in Hollywood and the entertainment industry. And this would definitely provide a motive for their killers to kill them. Now Chester, Chester supposedly k kills himself in his home, in his own home, okay? Where his own children are in other rooms in the same house when he does it. And apparently his feet are not off the ground and he's hanging off of a door. How do you hang yourself off a door? Now it can be done. But it's an inefficient mode of, of strangulation or neck breakage. Or impeding the carotid artery. And it's very, it's very painful. And Chester had spoken in his very last interview about the fact that he had had a broken leg and he was so averse to pain that he would have to be heavily sedated on drugs drugs mind you to even get a tattoo and you're saying that he hung himself off a door one of the most painful inefficient ways to go in his own house with his children present and no drugs but a partially drunk bottle of liquor Chester's not going to kill himself he was full of big plans for his future and had he's got some ridiculous number of kids more than four with two different women at least two different women Chester was not suicidal Chris was not suicidal And by putting a hit on these guys, and then in particular claiming that it was suicide, you defame their legacies. It's not just tainting their legacy. You're making everything that they did as rock and rollers, all the courage and the vulnerability and the originality that they demonstrated as, as cutting-edge artists, which cut into the hearts of millions, evoking joy and love and pleasure for millions upon millions upon millions of people. The powers that were the Illuminati fuckfaces want to do their blood sacrifice on these two individuals and make it look like suicide so that their legacies are that if you are a truly successful rock star artist I give your gift of your spirit and your art to millions. You're really just a selfish, ultra selfish jerk who would do that to your families. You kill yourself for what? When your careers are booming, your families are doing well, there's no reason to commit suicide. This is so suspicious. It's beyond suspicious. It's just like they're mocking us. And this pertains to how I've watched people in the rock and roll community go from completely asleep sheep who buy into the bullshit of Rolling Stone and B magazine and buy into the bullshit of Bruce Springsteen endorsing Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. Fuck you, Bruce Springsteen. I'm never, I can never listen to his work with pleasure anymore. He's the worst kind of sellout. Maybe not the worst, but we're going to have to grade them 
on a 1 to 100 scale of how sold out are they. But if you openly endorse Hillary and Obama, you're openly endorsing satanic pedophilia. And I know that you know that, Bruce Fuckface Springsteen. And Eddie Vedder being ultra close with known gatekeeper Illuminati Satanist Johnny Depp and going out of their way, Johnny Depp and Eddie Vedder both, to help exonerate the West Memphis Three who are confessed killers of three little boys and definite ritual Satanists and Eddie Vedder confesses with his gravelly sincerity that he hears the voice of Damien Eccles on his shoulder. You hear the voice of a sociopathic, satanic child murderer? That's the cause that you would support? This is at a level of twistedness and evil and shock for me and disillusionment. Eddie Vedder and Pearl Jam were not my number one band. I mean, my number one bands were U2 and Alice in Chains and Soundgarden. But he was at that next level down. And I always admired Eddie Vedder because he was one of those guys who took, I thought, the values of punk rock into the mainstream. And he did that in particular with Don't Call Me Daughter and um, Better Man, where I thought, oh, he's really, like Kurt Cobain, sensitive to the viewpoints of women. And a punk rocker who's sensitive to the viewpoints of women, that's a good image and a good formula for the mainstream to be exposed to, and I would want that. But what happened is, you can be as talented of a singer, and I think Eddie Vedder is one of the naturally most beautifully gifted sounding voices like Michael Stipe. He's just naturally beautiful sounding. One of the greatest singers who've ever lived. And Michael Stipe. But you could be as talented as that, and you can have as righteous of a cultural pedigree in terms of punk rock and feminism and still get it wrong and become a satanic child murdering or a child murderer condoning Illuminati Hollywood rock and roll rock star creep Eddie Vedder it's evil vomit crap shit hell that's what you mean to me now what song can I ever listen to yours again and my beloved second ex-wife totally brainwashed by your bullshit. She just thinks you're it. You, you and Jack White. So the Eddie Vedder connection to the West Memphis Three and Johnny Depp is some of the most toxically disgusting disillusioning, evil, satanic, ridiculously, almost unimaginably evil crap. And I know the people who are just, just gleefully tearing apart the Hollywood elites from a right-wing perspective are, are really enjoying this process. It's not so enjoyable for me. Because I, I, want, I, I was a wannabe of that rock and roll elite. I want to break in to the insiders <clears throat> who never had any time for this rock star here. You know, I've been at this game of trying to break in for 33 years. I don't know if I know of any rocker who's really tried for a longer time to really make a go of it. You know, I'm six albums in. Admittedly, I don't think I was an A-lister until 2013 as a singer or a songwriter. So I'm really not complaining for the years before that. But now it is time, I think, for Swaybone to be recognized and utilized by the masses as a, a healthy, nutritious substitute for what I'm sure is going to the same thing that's going to happen to the Catholic Church is 
a billion Catholics are going to get indigestion and they just will not accept satanic ritual sacrifice of children or, or, or systematic kidnapping of, of millions of kids to rape them and, and, and eat them. There is a limit to how much brainwashing the sheeple will accept. And there's a point at which the whole Catholic Church, there's really going to be nothing left of it that's not rotten. And all the treasures that they've been keeping to themselves will have to be given back to humanity. So, you know, we've got to reassimilate Catholicism, you know, and, and, and render it harmless. Get get the, the Vatican's financial controls off of, you know, humanity's neck. But the same thing that's going to happen to Catholicism is going to happen to certain rock stars. Bruce Springsteen, Eddie Vedder and Pearl Jam. Bob Dylan. I mean, just to name a few off the top of my head that are like, they're so rotten, they're already associated with known violations. And then Bono and U2. That's just a pile of crap. Not musically. The tragedy is that their music is so darn great. And it was good enough for me to get to where I am today by just being a real fan of their music. But Dylan's got no love, and u 2s got no truth. And Eddie Vedder, as a Satanist on his shoulder, who likes to kill kids, and every single crime committed by rockers in order to pay some price for fame. I need to know what it is, I need to expose it to the world because I can't have my rock and roll be unclean. I can't have my rock and roll be um, controlled by the Illuminati anymore because I still want to be famous. I want to ascend in, in into the rock and roll hierarchy and I will not be denied. But I'm not going to um, compromise to the Illuminati so the Illuminati has to be gotten rid of so that I can have a career in rock for real. I've been at it long enough and I'm ready and I deserve it. And y'all are going to need this rock star and more like me to come to balance out the consumerist, materialistic, Illuminati satanic controlled music industry messaging and activities of your heroes. So, one more thing. The death of Chester and Chris has vindicated the importance of rock and roll in culture and history and society right now in a way I really didn't expect. <clears throat> and to give you a kind of window into this, I would use the example of the recent investigations and revelations made by Randy Rocket Cody, who is a rocker, is a rock and roller, and is involved in the metal communities, and he has done more to do serious research on the forensics, the toxicology, and every investigative significant feature that I'm aware of, the cases of, of Chris Cornell and Chester Bennington. <clears throat> and when you look at his, the evolution of his consciousness, if you like, on the issue of conspiracy in rock and the death of these two guys and Kurt now, he admits that when, when Chris died, he had a, a moment of, of starting to delve into the conspiracy, if you like, the um, the potential that he was murdered. But then he got into the pedophilia aspects of it. He saw where this was leading, where he got, how far down the rabbit hole this went. 
and he started to back off a little bit. So yes, that rocker consciousness was waking up in Randy Rocket Cody when Chris was killed. But then he started to backtrack a little. He started to withdraw, retreat from the investigation and maybe feel like he couldn't do it. But then Chester dies and something snaps. And now I could tell you, Randy Rock Cody is a soldier for the cause. He's going to get to the truth of the matter. And I've never seen a rock and roller that woke, okay? That able to reference the Illuminati and blood sacrifice and satanic pedophilia as being endemic to rock and roll. But I have to mention, it wasn't enough for one great rock star to die right now. It had to be two. Because if it takes two to wake up Randy Rocket Cody, then that's what it is going to take to wake up the rest of us rockers. And it's gradually starting to happen in the rocker community, the way this discourse and, and consideration and consciousness raising has been happening in the hip hop community with the examples I gave before of Professor Griff, Black Dot, and others. Lauren Hill, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> who have boldly, bravely come out to talk truth about how the Illuminati has infected the rap and hip hop industry. But there was a lag in rock. I think rock has been infected for a longer period and I think that also hip hop has a faster metabolism of of, of going through a growth and death cycle in culture and so they just burn into this conspiracy process much more quickly but now it's finally happening in the rockers and another example is Dave Lucero Dave Lucero in Sacramento who ha has his video blog about Chris and Chester's death and you see his consciousness process happening as he wakes up so now we're seeing the rockers waking up, finally. <clears throat> and for me, this means I'm, I'm, I'm recognizing, I'm re-appreciating the power of rock music and why the Illuminati would even care to sacrifice a couple of grunsters. Because in my view, the mainstream society hypes up the rock star, but then tears them down later. It's always this like process of defaming rock and rollers after their peak moment. And I kept hearing the same message, just like when p painting was dead in the 50s and 60s, that horrible message, rock is dead. Rock is being replaced by a more relevant contemporary youth culture, i.e. hip hop rap and, and some kind of egregious post R&B pop music with auto-tune and that's the next big thing and rock is the dinosaur of the past and grunge rock also is just like fit for the casino circuit or something it's it's put out to pasture it's it's now comfortably part of the repertory and no longer harmful no longer a threat no longer a dangerous movement that's alive and kicking but that's just not true. And one of the things that woke me up in this whole process, after Chester dies, you know, I'm revisiting Linkin Park and I'm actually finding that I do have a connection to their music. And, and I'm looking at their top three songs on YouTube. You know, they have like 500 views on one song. That, I'm sorry, 500 million views on one song, 300 plus million views on another. I'm like, geez, if you add this all up and all the other channels that they're on and CDs and Blu-ray and um, MTV and whatever else channels that you could see Linkin Park on right now, they probably got a billion views in the world at any given time or just in, in a certain time period. So grunge is a billion strong just in Linkin Park. And the adulation and appreciation and depth of respect for Chris Cornell just seems endless. And the more you dig into his back catalog, his solo work, the audio slave work, and the Soundgarden work, 
He's looking pretty damn great. In fact, he's looking like one of the best singers and the best overall artists that America's ever produced. And being damn beautiful and just being one of the best singers of all time. So, gosh, he's looking like a pretty juicy blood sacrifice if you're in Illuminati headspace. Maybe grunge rock and rock and roll and rock stars are not just trivial, freakish little gnomes that can be exalted and dispensed with in the, in the consumer cycle process. Maybe they're not just trivial. Maybe they're not just expendable. I'll tell you why. Because there ain't no religion anymore. There's no political movement anymore that moves people the way the good, less satanic or non-satanic rock and roll does. Rock and roll has the power to touch people more deeply than the crappy fake Christianity and the crappy fake capitalism and the crappy fake military industrial complex and the crappy fake political structure. Rock and roll, the parts that aren't completely sold out, the parts that are still good, are great and have the power of a world religion to impact people's emotional center and therefore move the people. Rock and roll is a serious threat. It's still a threat. It's still the most important art form and perhaps the biggest political change agent that's ever been on the planet. The biggest force of cooperative community and collectivism and joyful solution-based human coexistence that's ever happened. It's transnational. It's transgalactic. Rock has no limit. And I'm here to restore rock and reclaim the value of it. And to do so, it has to be valued within education. It has never been valued within education. But rock is the most significant and important thing and therefore has the power and the political impact to possibly be a historic change agent at this very moment. Because what it looked like what was happening was it was not the Hollywood actors that were going to name names in elite pedophilia networks. Because, uh, yes, Elijah Wood came out, a Corey <clears throat> Feldman, and a little bit Jim Carrey, and a little bit Brad Pitt. But none of them are naming names. Maybe it's the rock stars that are the true Jesus-like, self-sacrificial, beautiful martyrs that were charged with the duty to break Pizzagate, ped Pedogate open the way only rock stars and their feeling connection to their fans can do. Because once all those people who are emotionally connected to Linkin Park and emotionally connected to Soundgarden and Audio Slave get wind of the pedophilia that they were not only going to reveal in the entertainment industry, but name names. It was the rockers who were going to lead the charge in the entertainment industry when it comes to naming names. Hello everybody. Oh, once, this is Theo Cedar Jones and I wanted to add a third section to my video about Chester Bennington and Chris Cornell. And that is, how do we avoid things like this happening in the future? How do we protect our artists and our rock stars and our rock bands from being preyed upon by the Illuminati? So this is what this video is about. This is the long-term solution. This is how do we get out of this problem and not repeat 
the death of Kurt Cobain, the death of Chester Bennington, and the death of Chris Cornell and others. Blood sacrifices to um, Malak, Satan. Illuminati sacrifices to self-interested greed personified in rituals and we need to disengage from the system the Illuminati system is over and where it begins is what I want to do for my band Swaybone which is organize tours um, based on all ages venues so that we bypass the Illuminati toxicity of alcohol. The entire rock and roll industry is mediated by alcohol toxicity. And that's part of how it's kept down. And that's part of how the youth are kept divided away from their own culture. Because you can't get to a rock concert until you're 21 if they sell alcohol, especially the concerts of local bands. All those are almost completely shut out to youth audiences because of alcohol sales. Um, or if they do let the youth in, there's still alcohol being sold, and it's a toxic atmosphere for young people. Altogether, it you know, alcohol sale is pure sabotage of rock and roll. It's not fun and games. It's not for whimsical purposes. It's to sabotage the safety of the rock audience, forcing them to dump out of the clubs at 2 a.m. when drinking laws say you have to and not having any BART service in the Bay Area after midnight is a formula, is a socially engineered design for self-destruction and damage to the nightlife and constant suppression to the nightlife which never can take off. It can never hit the level of what Seattle was during the grunge era which is a major global factory of culture and art which lifts up the entire region for a variety of reasons. So the goal is to make the Bay Area like Seattle in the grunge era. But we need to do something for bands that are touring and they have to disengage themselves from this alcohol toxicity Illuminati control system in the rock clubs. So, step one. All ages tours to the maximum degree that you can create grassroots tours that are based on clubs like Gilman Street and others that are all ages venues that do not sell alcohol that do not base their business model on alcohol sales and so that's a major project for my band and this leads to point number two when a young artist is identified by their community instead of suppressing that individual and setting up an endless series of hurdles. For example, in the case of rock and roll, you're constantly asked to choose between having a career in rock and eating and surviving. If you were to take a week off to go on tour, it is so difficult to leave your job or get all the holiday time because you only get at best, two weeks of holiday time per year, and you got to line up all the holiday time of you and three or four other bandmates. So what? You can go on maybe one week-long tour a year if you're lucky, or two? It's not possible to build a fan base touring one week a year or two weeks a year. You need to be touring three weeks on, three weeks off, six months a year at least to get to your critical fan base that can then support you financially. But the wage slavery system puts every rock musician and band in the position where they are always making a choice between their art and sheer survival, let alone raising a family. So if society valued the artist for all the benign contributions that they make in their lifetime and throughout the very great length of their legacy that could go on for centuries. If society wants the upliftment that the grunge era brought to literally billions, 
then we have to support the artist from birth. We have to support the rock bands proactively. Right now there is no public support for rock bands. There are no grants for rock bands. There is no public education for rock and roll. There are no unions for rock bands. There's no guild or global organized support of any kind for rock bands, rock musicians in this world. After all the contributions that rock bands and musicians have made, which are largely positive and benign, except when they were subverted by the Illuminati into Satanism, sadly, many of our rockers have succumbed, but many did not, and many only partially, to the extent that a great body of work has survived that Illuminati tarnishing process. And that legacy is the greatest and most positive legacy that humans have made, the bravest, most courageous, and generous, and most beautiful, testably authentic legacy, not a moon mission that's fake kind of bullshit. Rock is real, and it's provable through decades of proof that it's good and that it's real. So, if we gave rock and roll the subsidies, the public subsidies and financing that, say, the steel industry gets, or the railroads get, or the petroleum and fossil fuels industry get, or the military industrial complex and big pharmaceuticals altogether get all kinds of funding subsidies at major universities, all kinds of financing for research, all kinds of money to offset liability, all kinds of proactive support for big pharma from government taxpayer money. So y'all, rock and rollers deserve their share of public support, do they not? And if rock and roll were to get its share of public money, we could do the following. Identify every rock artist, every rock band in the United States that requires support from the earliest time in their life when they need it and make sure that they don't have to reinvent the wheel when it comes to finding management for their band because there's a guild that has proactive support for all the management needs of any band or artist. They don't have to fend for themselves in a shark-infested marketplace of controlled by the Illuminati to get a manager or a producer. All those things are given for free. And if that youth or that band makes a million fans, of course the producers and all the stakeholders in their success get their fair share of the profits but they don't exploit them up front as gatekeepers of the Illuminati and rape them and kill them and make them sign contracts that are evil. We support the artist from birth if needed to go their way because their way, if we let them do it, has always proven to be an upliftment to the larger society if it's not tainted by the Illuminati. So every child, every artist, every rock band, and every rock star is always given the support they need in their career from their guild. And this brings up the other point. The firm, the free union of renunciate messengers is also the firm, the free union of radical musicians. Worldwide, I now proclaim the firm is also a grand union, a grand global guild of all rock and rollers. And we will channel the money to support any and all rockers. So they don't have to fend for themselves in shark infested marketplace, ever. So that they don't have to sell alcohol to make a buck, ever. So they don't have to sign their lives away to evil contracts, ever. Where the artist, the rocker, is sovereign, respected, supported, nurtured, protected.
part of what is going to be necessary to do this is a living wage for artists and rockers. This will just simply cut the problem off at the root. If they want to spend six months on tour, they can take off and go on tour. If they need to spend three years making their masterpiece without a distraction, they can motherfucking do that! because the living wage assures it. And finally, we will systematically restore all urban nightlife amenities, starting, of course, in Oakland. We will build three new all-ages nightclubs in Oakland. We will build a new bathhouse for the public. We will create benign transport systems and a fantastic weekly periodical that reviews the live shows in the Bay Area and celebrates the live rockers and rock music scene so that you could pick up an issue every week and find out who was hot last week and who's hot tonight. Because going out to live music is what everybody does every night of the week. It's what you do. It's what our culture is. Rock and roll is the best thing we've ever done. Rock is the best thing we can do. Rock and roll is everything. It is life. It is the totality of our political, spiritual, cultural existence. It is better than religion ever was. So embrace it. Let's do it.